Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be attempting a very complicated micro soldering repair to this iPhone 5. I'm going to try and repair pry damage caused by a previous housing replacement. It is an older phone, but as someone who's just starting out with micro soldering, it's best to start with something cheap or something you already have. This iPhone 5 fits both of these categories. Both the home and power buttons don't work, even after replacement. This means the only way to power on or wake the phone from sleep is to plug in the charger. Very inconvenient. I received this phone in a lot of devices I paid $50 for. An absolute bargain as it included a gold-plated iPhone 5. The logic board that was installed in it at the time was this iOS 7.0.4 board with no home or power button function. In that previous video, I replaced both the power and home buttons to no avail. Even directly shorting the home button pins with tweezers did nothing. So I put that board aside, hoping to one day fix it. Five months later, I've just picked up a camera microscope, which is required to do this pry damage repair. It sounded like a great first project with my new equipment. Firstly, I'll need to open up the damaged phone. I did assemble the board into its original housing, which was included in the lot, but it's not complete. As there wasn't any screws holding the display in place, it can be lifted up using a suction cup and some plastic picks. It's missing several parts inside, but that makes disassembling it easier. I'll unplug and remove the battery before detaching the display. For this repair, we don't have to disassemble the phone much further. However, I will need to remove this interconnect cable so we can get access to the components behind the SIM tray. As I suspected, we have some board damage in this area. Bringing things up closer under the microscope, we can see there's a detached chip floating around inside as well as another that's completely missing. Once we get a hold of the loose chip, we can take a closer look at it. This IC is known as the U3 chip, and its presence on the board is vital for power and home button functionality. In terms of size, here's what it looks like compared to a grain of rice and a single crystal of sugar. This component is microscopical. However, we aren't able to reuse this one as two of its solder pads are missing. At this point, you may also be wondering how does pry damage occur? Well, it's caused by improper removal of the battery. Often, the removal tabs break and people try prying the battery out by wedging their tool against the logic board, thinking if the tab was there, it must be okay. However, what happens is they knock off tiny components like the ones we discovered earlier. As we need a replacement chip, I'll need to get one from a donor phone. This silver one has extreme water damage. Although it turns on, there's no image on the screen, so I'll harvest its U3 chip. Next to that chip is the DZ101RF. Its purpose is to protect the SIM card from electrostatic. It's completely missing on the phone we're trying to fix, although it's not necessary for the phone to function, and its absence will not be noticed. I started by adding flux to the board before trying to add a small amount of low mount solder to the pads on the chip in an effort to make it come off easier. I then hit it with 280 degrees of hot air in the hopes it would come free. I didn't want the temperature to be too high as it might damage the plastic on the SIM reader. My first attempt was a failure, so I added some more solder and tried again. This time, the chip broke free. Given it also had a pad underneath, complicated its removal. Inspecting the chip reveals a bit of damage around the edges. As I have no idea what way it's supposed to be installed, I'm going to just have to leave it off, as installing it the wrong way around will prevent SIM cards from being detected. But it's time for the star of the show to come out, the U3 chip. I'll apply what I've learnt from removing the last one to hopefully do a better job this time. After all, practice makes perfect. Using plenty of flux, I added some low melt solder paste using a soldering iron before removing the chip with hot air. The chip came off without issue. However, I didn't like the look of it, so I wanted to have one last shot using another donor board. At the beginning, I was using tiny blue tweezers, but I found the needle nose iFixit tweezers much more sturdy, accurate, and less prone to having the chip go flying away. And given these chips are less than a millimeter big, they are hard to find if you lose them. 
This time I was happy with the removed chip, so it's time we got it reattached to our original logic board. Before doing so, I'll need to clean off the solder pads on both the board and chip itself to the best of my abilities. The best method would be to remove all the old solder and apply new solder. However, as I've found this repair difficult enough, I don't want to risk damaging the pads. Until I get more comfortable with working at such a tiny level, we're only going for functional, not the cleanest, best job possible. It's fair to say I spent a good amount of time trying to find components that have blown off the end of my tweezers. Thankfully, they never got too far away and I was able to retrieve them. With the chip in place, it's time to get it soldered down, which is easier said than done. I'd estimate it took me about 30 to 40 minutes. I had my hot air station set at 380 degrees, which was enough to slightly melt the back of the sim reader, but not enough to cause any functional damage to it. With one problem solved, I'd caused another. One of the nearby capacitors had come free after I'd knocked it with my tweezers, which is incredibly easy to do. I thought attaching the IC was difficult, but this capacitor is even smaller. The biggest problem I was facing was positioning it over the solder pads. You have to remember, we are talking about moving a component a quarter of a size of a crystal of sugar, a few micrometers. It's really hard. I tried soldering it in place using an iron, but that was just too big and kept causing the component to move around. In the end, I found it was lacking solder, so adding more to both ends allowed the component to snap into position when heated with hot air. And with that, our capacitor is back into position. I did also knock an IC to the left of the U3 chip, however it only has three pads, one of them being a long one on the bottom. So while it doesn't look the best, it'll be perfectly fine. Now that we've soldered everything we need to, we can clean everything off with alcohol. I also noticed the connector for the charging port had come off of its cable. I must have unintentionally hit it at some point with some hot air. Nevertheless, I can remove the connector and reinstall a new charging port later on. However, what's most important is testing out our phone. I'll reconnect the display and battery and press that power button. Unfortunately, nothing happened. Does that mean we fried the entire phone or does the power button and home button still not work? I'll try another battery and a new charging port to see if that makes any difference. Connecting it to the charger, this time we get a battery flat icon. I'll short out the home button terminals to see whether or not the home button is functioning. Surprisingly, the phone lit up again with the battery flat icon. But I'm still getting no response from the power button. After letting the phone charge up for a little, it booted right up. But I'm still getting the same result. At least the home button function is back. But I haven't given up yet. I want to try a new power button cable. I have no idea if the one in the housing even works. After attaching a new cable, it seems we have indeed restored the power button functionality too. My newbie micro soldering job might not be the prettiest, but it actually works. And this phone once again has working power and home button functionality. That was the hardest soldering job I've done so far, but hopefully with time I'll get even better and fix a few newer devices. But I think it's time this logic board goes back into the housing it was destined for, the 24 karat gold casing. As that housing is fully complete, all I'll have to do is swap across the motherboard from this frame into the gold one. And with the iPhone 5, that couldn't be any easier. With only a few screws and cables, the board can come free. Now I'll get to disassembling the gold phone. It does already have a logic board installed, although it's locked and was only ever a placeholder until I found one to replace it with. As the casing is plated in gold, I'll need to take extra care when opening it, avoiding sliding the pick around the edges and instead just using it to lever the display open. Once the battery is disconnected, I can unfasten the display's bracket and remove the several flex cables attaching the display to the logic board inside the phone. With the battery out of the way, it's now time to remove the logic board from the device. This process will be undertaken just like the other phone. 
The only difference is this one has all of its screws and brackets in place. Once the board is free, it's still attached with one antenna cable underneath. That'll need to be detached before it can be fully removed from the frame and we can attach our iOS 7.0.4 board that we've just repaired using some micro soldering. Carefully weaving it through all of the cables, it can be seated down into position. I'll seat the LED flash and camera into their correct spots before fastening all of the screws and brackets back onto the logic board. Proceeding, I can install the SIM card tray before connecting all of the remaining flex cables back onto the logic board. It's important to fasten the interconnect cable before attaching the volume and power button flex cable, as it'll need to run underneath that cable. Once that's all done, it's time for the display. While the screen on here isn't cracked, it's a very low aftermarket quality display with poor colours. As I have a replacement, I might as well install it. But before I can do so, I'll need to remove the home button, earpiece flex cable and display bracket to transfer to the new display, as it didn't come with any of these parts already added. As the iPhone 5 lacks any biometric security, it has no paired home button, or any other user replaceable parts for that matter. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a refurbished display panel, as these aren't available on the market anymore, at least from what I can tell. So if you want an original display panel, you'll likely have to pull it off another phone. So this is unfortunately an aftermarket panel, but hopefully it'll be better than the one that was already on this gold phone. So that the home button doesn't spin around, you can add a small bead of liquid adhesive around the perimeter of the original gasket to help hold it in place. Or if you have it, a replacement gasket. Nothing makes a repair look worse than a wonky or crooked home button. I'll also take this opportunity to clean off our home button before reattaching it into our new display panel. Once the plastic button is installed, we can attach the mechanism that goes behind it. Afterwards, our display assembly is complete. It can be cleaned off with a microfiber cloth before being reattached into the phone. Proceeding, the battery can be installed into the phone before the remaining brackets are attached. With that, I can clean off the insides of the phone with a microfiber cloth to remove any dust or fingerprints before attaching the display into our gold-plated housing. After firmly pressing it down into position, the two pentalobe screws can be reinstalled into the bottom of the iPhone. After which, the plastic protective film can be removed from our new display panel. Now all that's left to do is install a tempered glass screen protector. And we're done. So this is it. My first complex micro soldering repair was a success. We were able to resurrect this iPhone 5 that had fallen victim to pry damage and installed it into a gold plated housing. This was definitely the hardest repair I've undertaken so far. It was a great experience, although I couldn't recommend anyone undertake this themselves. If you have an issue like this yourself, just take it to a professional. This phone has no iCloud account, but is locked with a passcode. As I don't want to update the phone and Apple doesn't allow you to reinstall older iOS versions, I'll have to get the passcode. I removed the disabled screen and tried the passcodes the seller thought it might have been, but none worked. I also tried a few common ones too, without success. As there's 10,000 possible combinations, it's going to take a while. But don't worry, I'll crack away at it. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the micro soldering playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.